Max broke McLaren's record and Lando broke <laughs> Red Bull's trophy. So kind of payback for it's breaking insane. the record. <laughs> What are the odds that <laughs> Red Bull breaks a record that McLaren held for 35 years and then at the celebration ceremony for this, Lando, a McLaren driver, breaks Red Bull's first place trophy? And welcome back to Formula Breakdown. It's Ross and Caleb again. It's round 12 of the F1 2023 World Championship, the Hungarian Grand Prix. It's in the pocket, Caleb. It's out of sight. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Had a good weekend. Uh, tried not to melt this weekend. How about you? Doing good, man. Same. It is hot here in Texas, but that didn't stop you from doing a little bit of racing of your own today. You want to tell me a little bit about that and how you guys wound up? Yeah, so it was an autocross event and it's basically in a parking lot with a bunch of cones, very sanctioned. It's kind of like drive what you bring, race what you brung, what it, however that saying goes. I forgot what it, how it is, but I mean, I could have entered my personal car if I wanted to, but I wasn't about to do that because as we've been talking, I've been trying to sell the thing. So not trying to toast the tires or the brakes. So a few people from work participated in it and I rode passenger on one of the rides. We did pretty good except a part fell off of the car midway through. So that was a little startling to hear some clanking noises and you're like, oh, what is that? What's about to happen? But um, yeah, it seemed like you were going a hundred miles per hour, but really we were in a little Mazda Miata probably going about 40 or 50. Oh, nice. So you kind of taken a cue card out of Alpine's book today. You guys decided to lose a few pieces of your ride. Cool, man. Well, that sounds like a blast. We, we've got to do something at some point in real life, like get some of our friends together and go karting or something because, you know, I've got the bug now and it would be nice to actually take that into the real world yeah. instead of just watching it all the time. Are you ready to talk about some F1? Yeah. Well, this is, of course, the first weekend where we were going to see the new tire allocations for qualifying. And you know what? It really helped to shake things up for this qualifying session. It allowed, at least this weekend, a lot of teams the chance to move up the grid. So we saw people like Alfa Romeo make it into Q3, both of them, which I can't even remember the last time that's happened. Uh, you had Russell out in Q1, and then you had Sainz out in Q2. Just kind of allowed other people to put in... An unusually good Saturday. Elsewhere, though, the other Mercedes looking awesome. Uh, Hamilton secured his first pole position since Saudi Arabia in 2021 by just like a thousandth of a second or two. Only the second non-Red Bull pole position of the season. Uh, Leclerc with his kind of fluke pole position at Azerbaijan. Caleb, did you enjoy this Saturday qualifying session? And do you think if the format, if it's adopted fully, could help keep things more interesting and competitive? Yeah, it was an interesting qualifying session for sure. Both Alfa Romeo's made it all the way into Q3, which was absolutely nuts. I didn't think they had that kind of pace. We've always kind of made fun of them this year as being the team that's on the grid, but nobody ever hears about. Now come race day, that kind of happened. But they made a statement in qualifying, as well as Mercedes. Well, at least Lewis Hamilton did. And then we also saw the Haas of Nico Hulkenberg make it into Q3, which he's done that a few times this year. He's got pretty good qualifying pace, but I was kind of not against this setup of qualifying, but I was definitely like raising an eyebrow of like, oh, what, why do we need to do this? I really don't think it's going to change too much. I think I need to see more examples of this at different tracks until I'm completely set on it. But this little sampling of it did make it interesting for sure. And I watched the entire qualifying thing and it was way more exciting than what the race had to give. Yeah, it played into the evolution of the track for sure. Like no one could rely on their first running, of course. And then you had track limit things going on as well. Again, that added kind of to the drama. I, I liked it. Again, it may not work at a track like Singapore or Brazil or I don't know. So I, I would definitely want to see it tested. I really think they should make a judgment call and, and do another one of these before the end of the season because the other the other race, of course, it was supposed to be tested at, was canceled. So I think they should pick a race near the end of the season and try it again and see what happens. I know they did some testing at Silverstone as well after the race, but if this is any indication of what we could expect, I think it's good. I think it allows other teams to have an opportunity to perform 
because maybe the Williams is way better on a medium tire at a different track like Brazil where the ele elevation is higher and they get they both get into Q3 or something, you know? So that to me is fun because it, it makes the strategy a little bit more dynamic instead of just put on the, the fast tire and go quick. And even practice was all over the place this weekend. Like I didn't have a real bead on who was going to be fastest. When I saw Max qualify second and Hamilton get the pole position i was like well shit what what's going on here like lando was right on the heels of max he wasn't that far off either so it was somewhat concerning because i was like okay does the red bull this new car does it not have the pace that it usually has in qualifying or what's going on here so it definitely evened out the field i think a little bit that or just max was having an off day and just didn't get pole for once but it it definitely made for an interesting saturday and i think they should do this at another track i hope hopefully they'll maybe announce something like that after the summer break i don't see a problem with doing this one or two other times for the rest of the year yeah i didn't hear too much barking after the fact you know if there is everyone seemed pretty happy which is kind of rare because usually anytime there's a change to anything the principals yeah. and the team representatives and the drivers start like oh this is horrible and it makes racing less fun and da 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 I mean, I think this is innocent. I think this is a small enough tweak for them and a big enough change for us, the fans, that it's going to work. Yeah. So I think they should really consider it. I like this better than the sprint races. I think we all like this better than the sprint races. Maybe because it's just a small <laughs> change and the sprint race is a big, huge change. So I definitely like this. Mm -hmm change to the qualifying scenario it's it actually made it fun to watch and you didn't i mean when joe went first i think in q1 it was like oh what <laughs> like what's going on here yeah, it was wild <laughs> he ended up fifth yeah he out, he out qualified valtteri yeah like that was insane and whenever i saw that i was like what is going on like did max's lab get deleted what happened like why is he so much faster than everybody on these hearts so it was definitely like okay this is cool really really tight up there in q3 that with the times and i think some of this is just track position like joe was in the right place at the right time and had the right lap yeah the track's small yeah it's short lap and honestly like i don't know about you i did not see hamilton taking pole here i really thought this would be probably between max and lando as we were seeing things shake out then to see that fine of a margin determine the order i mean it just gets you more excited for sunday caleb any more thoughts about qualifying before we start digging into the race my friend i didn't love how small the track was i mean that's nothing we can change but you know it made it really busy russell did get caught out but he was holding up everybody so that was interesting seeing everybody just pass by him as he was trying to queue up for his lap so that's what made him miss out was because there were so many cars and they could only be so equally spaced that distance it, it's just impossible did you catch the angles of them just driving past russell like i think yeah. it was gas yeah. you just like nearly just beat it through the grass to get around him and get positioned yeah because some of these teams were desperate to get another lap in and so was russell but he just couldn't get that that's that pace going into that corner because everybody kept cutting him off but he was slowing so far down and making this huge gap and everybody else was like well, we are not waiting we are cutting in this line and we are getting in front of you sorry yeah it seems like a common trend with mercedes because i think when hamilton was out in q1 a few races ago it was the same deal like they mistimed it he got stuck behind some people he shouldn't have been behind and yeah I mean, it's You're kind out, of, buddy. it's kind of so. driver's code. It's not a rule, but everyone, well, it doesn't seem like everybody's following that uh, code, yeah. you know? And I think George is like the head of like the driver thing, not a union, but the people who talk to the FIA, I think he's after Vettel left. I think he's the head of it now. So like everyone just basically, I could totally <laughs> see him in that role with his little latte yeah, and his yeah. like, <laughs> So I think, Socks on display. I think everybody just like threw a middle finger to him. It was like, stop holding us up. We are going. <laughs> no, but honestly, like since we're probably not going to talk about Russell later, really nice rescue from him going from like 18th to 6th. You know, that was yeah. pretty mighty. So, and th there was no safety cars or anything. So he just did that on merit and strategy. Yeah. Really good Saturday. I'm not hundred percent sure how I feel about today's race though. We had a really busy start that honestly, pretty much the first few laps kind of dictated what the rest of this race was. We had both Alpines retire right from the gate after some contact with one another. Brought up on from Joe Guan Yu, who had like an anti-stall going on. It was like a replay of Austria for the Alpines. Really horrible. Immediately eliminated them from contention. And then we saw, because of Joe and a shuffling of that order back there, their great qualifying session basically 
undone. I think Joe dropped like 10 places. Valtteri dropped like five and all the other teams benefited. McLaren had an amazing start. Both of them got around Hamilton. They ended up in two, three, kind of a redo of what we saw at Silverstone. That helped them finish really well yet again. Lando on a podium, second place, second time in a row. First time he's ever had back-to-back -back podiums. They're extending their lead over Alpine. Now they're firmly in fifth place. Piastri in fifth. Um, did you have good feel? They were, uh, again, McLaren was kind of the highlight of this race. Are you surprised how well they're like maintaining this? Yeah, so I didn't think they would be as good as they were at Silverstone. I knew they would be pretty decent, but I didn't think they were going to be on like as good as they were i mean it was just kind of shocking like yeah I, I think i picked lando to be on podium but at the same time it was like okay that's that's a pick like that's being hopeful because i just like seeing lando on sure. the podium but i didn't really think that they would be on there like they just had good pace and that car is pretty good now over the radio it seems like lando is driving his ass off and getting every little scent out of this car just to keep it in front of you know sergio near the end of the race he was really having to push that car when it seems like the red bulls probably aren't pushing near as hard as the mclarens happen to be pushed but i mean that's good i mean they can improve throughout the rest of the year and they can get a little bit better i don't think they're gonna win a race but i can definitely see them be on the podium more and more yeah me too i mean it's hard for, god caleb it's hard to imagine anyone winning a race right now that's not named verstappen but you know i think sometimes we see really good results from teams at one track and then it doesn't translate really well the rest of the season like Ferrari had a really good result a few races ago, and then it's just middling the rest of the time. Alpine lucked into some good results at Monaco. Alex Albon has had some good results here or there. So you kind of go into this expectation like, yes, McLaren did good here, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be doing great at the next race. Like Aston Martin hasn't been performing super great the last few races. Just interesting to see that McLaren's holding on to it. On the Aston Martin note, I think they just did their upgrades super early, which they did. They just kind of threw the whole kitchen at the car early on, and that's what they and that's what they got instead of like stretching this development out. And so they were good at the start of the season, but that car really isn't as good as we thought it was going to be. So they have I some mean, more it development. Never had a, it never had a, a patch on the Red Bulls like this McLaren seems to be able to do. Yeah, for sure. I think we should be talking more about the fact that Perez did not catch Lando Norris and he had the time to, and he just didn't. Yes, his tires were a little bit older than Lando's, but still, I think if that had been Max in third chasing Lando in the last 20 laps of the race or whatever, I think Max would have caught him. I'm sure Max would have caught yeah. him. The McLaren's actually kind of competing with the Red Bulls. Yeah, I think Sergio just wanted to finish the race on a podium at the same time. I, like, mean, I mean, that he it seemed like he played it safe all weekend except for in practice and just brought the car home. I, I think this McLaren's here to stay and I think we're going to see Aston Martin fall in the constructors as this season gets later and later unless they find some money and some time and some upgrades. But I think that's a really good point that you made. Like, they pulled the trigger early. It's almost like, do you remember in the Fast and Furious movies where Dom would be like, two too soon or when the guys press the NOS too early and then he'd blow right past them. I think that's maybe kind of what we're seeing here with Aston Martin. Like maybe they implemented their upgrades too early before all the facts became clear about the cars and they're kind of paying for it now. Yeah, I kind of think that's what happened. They, they need to introduce some big upgrades before the end of the year to really start competing again because they are definitely the third place Mercedes team. I would put probably McLaren and then Mercedes and then Aston Martin followed by Williams. Wow. It's just crazy that I don't think at any point this season Mercedes has been the, the top Mercedes team. So. Nope, they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of a non-Mercedes team, this was Daniel Ricciardo's first weekend back since 2022, and it kind of went about like I was expecting. First, qualifying 13th on Saturday, and that is right where he finished on Sunday. So, both days he did finish in front of Yuki Tsunoda, and... I mean, typically that was better than DeVries did. Like, I think DeVries landed 12th somewhere, like Monaco maybe, where half of the field was a mess and no one could pass. But generally speaking, Ricardo looking much quicker than DeVries. Uh, do you think this is a good indication of what we could expect from Ricardo for the rest of the season? Do you think this will allow him to maybe slip into the points some and yeah. help pull AlphaTauri out of the doldrums? I think it was a solid first outing. I mean, your body has to adapt to these cars. I mean, 
whenever he was doing his practice with or the when he was doing the tire test with Red Bull, you know, he was worried about his neck being sore, his legs being sore because you're, you know, constantly fighting all those G-forces. So this was his first race back in several months. And to hop in there, qualify better than your teammate, finish better than your teammate and finish the race. I mean, I think those are all solid things that he did. I mean, he was three places from being in the points. Who knows? if that would be strategy or what happened. I think it was just a solid outing. Now we're headed to Spa, where he has had some great finishes. He's won there before. He's had two other podiums with Red Bull at Spa. He did kind of good there with McLaren as well. He got a fourth place finish in 2021 with McLaren. We're going to a track that it seems like Daniel likes, so that should really tell us how good he is doing whenever he gets to that track. And we're going to talk about this more in a little bit, but it was hot as balls yeah. at this racetrack today. Over 50 degrees. Insane. Your first real race back in half of a year when really like this is one of those sports where your body, I'm sure, kind of gets calloused over as you're in it week in and week out. So for him to come in it kind of soft, I imagine he's going to be sleeping really good tonight. So I agree. It is about where I expected Daniel, but I expect a lot out of Daniel. This is a race winner. This is a guy who used to be in a team capable of winning instructors and drivers championships so i expect him to show up i think he will be expected to be bringing home some points very soon i think he gets points at spa all right i'm writing that down if you're wrong i get to drive your new car okay. all right we touched on checo a little bit and it looked like it was going to be another torrid weekend for checo because seconds into fp1 he plowed it right into the wall did who knows how much damage to his car they upgraded red bull which they had i think one set of extra parts for and you brought up him being kind of careful in the race. And I think that might have something to do with it because they had one replacement set of parts that were upgraded and that was it. And he was using them. But he did manage to make it to Q3 finally. The first time since May in Miami, but only P9. So again, I don't know if it was the new format that kind of shook him up a little bit or the fact that they keep sending him out first. <laughs> I think that might have something to do with it. He's like lined up at the exit every time first. So I think it might have something to do with the track evolving and him not getting to take advantage of that as much as the people who line up behind him but he did finish on a podium he got to third i feel like we spent more time looking at checo this race than almost anyone else it was the checo show he spent like the entire race climbing the field so he was passing like a madman driving like his life depended on it and ended up third were you happy to see this kind of curse broken and do you think this will be enough to kind of level out some tension and some feelings in red bull or do you think it's going to be this every week for the rest of the season i think he did a good job this weekend qualified safely into p9 i think that was just him being comfortable i don't think he's pushing the car yet you know he had that one accident and which was kind of like a freak accident and he just barely let the car just barely touch the grass and it just whipped around so yeah when i saw that in fp1 i was like oh jesus here we go again but he brought it back and you know he got a podium i think that's all wins in checo's book i think he's been having a confidence issue i mean it's been bad weekend after bad weekend and then ricardo is like oh i'm at alpha tauri now coming for your job checo and and it's just not looking good for him. It hasn't looked good for him for the past several weeks, at least on Red Bull's standards, whenever you're comparing him to the best racer on the field and the best car on the field. He's just not performing the past few weeks. But this week he did. He brought it home. Let's keep this momentum going into the summer break. Let's bring it on a podium next week. I, I think he just needs some more consistency. Yeah, you know what? I think the thing that just frustrates me the most about this is Helmet Marco's right, because I think he's a ghoul. I can't stand him. And earlier in the year, he basically said, Checo's got no shot at winning this championship at a time where it really looked like he did. I think there was like eight points between them or something or a few points and it really looked like there was going to be a battle. And at this point, there's no way. There's no way anybody's catching Max. This is going to be wrapped up at Singapore, maybe even before. I'm not sure if it could be finished mathematically before Singapore, but Checo's got no shot if he wins the rest of the races, I think. So, but it's nice to see him doing well again. I don't want anyone to lose their job necessarily. So I think this will be a fight that he has to have every weekend and live under that microscope so i hope he doesn't do any partying after any races i hope he goes home and sleeps and comes back in belgium and does it again i mean i think max is just going to continue to win i think he's going to beat vettel's record for consecutive wins which was nine in a row so i think that's easy to beat i mean max already beat his record last year of how many wins could he get i think that was like what 14 
or something like that in a season. I think that's about where he ended up. Yeah. It's insane to me that nine is it. I mean, that's in like, a row, figured, though. Nine in a row. I figured somebody like Senna or Schumacher or Stewart or somebody would have done double-digit race wins in a row at some point. Yeah, I guess I guess that's true. I mean, or Hamilton. I mean, McLaren did get 11 in a row, and that took 20 years to break. So I don't know what the record was before Vettel, who had it. It was harder to beat those records way back in the 80s because cars were hand-grenading and just there's way more reliability problems there is way better reliability nowadays and also you know there's way more like hey you can't bump this guy or you got to pass in a certain way or you're going to get penalized like people are running people off the road you know way back when so it's just a different sport than it was back then but yeah i think he breaks that record consecutively i, I could see him winning what is it like three more races or something like that i think he's won like six or seven in a row now forgot how many it's been but still i think he could easily break that record yep so let's get into that this was of course notable for being red bull's 12th straight race victory really interesting that the top five teams were the top 10 place finishers this weekend so it was aston martin mclaren ferrari mercedes and red bull really crazy you had that mixed up qualifying session but then it really basically divided itself out the top five teams in the top 10 the bottom five teams in the bottom 10 so red bull broke a 35 year old record previously held by mclaren and next week they look to extend that so they could set a record every weekend for the rest of the season if they do not lose and you know looking at the rest of the calendar caleb do you think there is a track that would be more likely they could lose on do you think it's possible that there's a team who could give red bull a headache what track like looking at the races we have left where do you think they have the best shot of losing maybe singapore something could happen i was thinking suzuka maybe maybe i don't know they didn't seem to have too big of a problem last I year. I think Suzuka is going to be a really good McLaren track, to be honest. That just seems like a, mm. a Lando track, all the sweepy corners and everything. Also, who knows with Vegas this year, what that is going to be like. Like, who knows? You know, that's that's just a oddball of a track. No one's drove on it other than in the F1 game. And even at that, it's not set up correctly because you're like redlining an eighth gear going down the straightaway because they don't have it set up correctly so who knows with those two tracks i mean singapore is kind of a wild card because it's a street race anything could happen and it's also singapore it could rain so but other than that i could see them winning the rest of the races i mean i think max is just going to start driving blindfolded for fun yeah this was his seventh race one in a row that's a personal record for him and i think we discussed it previously but he's only missed out on like 21 points the entire season so that means of his possible scored points, he's only missed out on 20-something. Insane stat. This is probably going to go down as the greatest single season any driver has ever had. And I hate to sound so dejected about that. It just makes for a not very fun broadcast. Like today especially, it really seemed to show. It really seemed like everyone spent the whole race managing tires. And not a ton of passing is taking place. There's some passing. Most of it Checo, it seemed like. To me, when it becomes that drivers versus the track instead of drivers versus each other, I find myself less entertained. Yes, I understand it's kind of a chess match and then the strategy all becomes very important, which is interesting to a degree. But for me, it makes for less exciting on-track action. You know, I definitely think there's been worse races this year, but this was really not very exciting. I really even felt like Jolien and Alex on commentary seemed to struggle to stay engaged with what was happening and, and seemed to struggle finding a positive spin. Kind of reminded me of Miami where things were happening but nothing felt. There was no tension to the race and I kind of found myself zoning out which honestly the last several races I haven't had that problem. So Caleb like how'd you feel about this race? Overall I think we'll both agree that qualifying was super exciting and but as far as the race it was okay you could look at it from a strategy point of view which I sometimes like strategy races I knew nobody was going to catch Max I mean he literally could do a pit stop and go out and still be in the lead that's how big of a lead he gained but the undercuts from Lando over his teammate was kind of interesting seeing George and Sergio start on the hards and make it up the grid that was kind of fun to watch and see how that actually worked out for them it's fun seeing like a strategy actually play out and actually work it's surprising that no other teams did that 
that because who knows what the grid might have looked like at the end of the race. I think starting on the hards was actually a pretty smart move and it did pay off for both of those drivers, more so for Russell. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like you're saying that the broadcast was kind of boring. I didn't really like the group that we had this year at this track. It was kind of like their B team, I think. Uh, I think it's David Coulthar. I don't really enjoy him on the broadcast. I don't know why. I just find him very boring, I guess. And then having a boring race on top of that didn't help any. So I, if I had to grade this race, I would probably grade it like a C, honestly. Like it passes, but it wasn't anything great. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, I kind of felt like C minus to C. The qualifying session really helped because when you have a fun Saturday, it gets you more jazzed for the race. And the start it was a really interesting start, which gave me hope that the whole race would be that way. But kind of like I mentioned earlier, the things that took place in the first two laps kind of set the stage for how the entire race was. Like not much changed. Like like we said, Ricardo started 13th and finished 13th. I know we said everything kind of shook out with the top five teams being in the points, but like none of that really made for a super exciting break. Yeah, you even said the first couple laps. I would say the first four turns were the yeah. most interesting part. A couple laps is like stretching it by a lot. Yeah, honestly. You know, it's just one of those tracks and I think a lot of this became a war of attrition. You got a really nice look at Max's tires at the end of the Grand Prix and they were just completely shredded. You know, and it's not like he did an overly long stint on them either. It's just the track temperatures were so insane that everybody was managing their tires and I think it led to more apprehension from everybody. Checo's a prime example. So just not my kind of race. I feel like we had the same issue in Miami and it just leads to a really boring broadcast. And I don't know how you fix that because it's not like you could just say, well, we're not racing today. It's really hot. You know, you can't do that. So it's just kind of bad luck of the draw for me, the viewer. Maybe some people really liked it. This is a personal one for sure, but that's just how I feel, man. Yeah. This track is just so small and there are barely any DRS zones. I mean, you've got that one stretch and then you've got like another one for like, I don't know, a few feet, it seems like. And just how the track is set up, I mean, we're stuck with it for another seven years, six, seven years yeah. till 2030. So there's no changing 2032, it. 2032, we will be 40. Yeah, yeah, let's not talk about that. Yeah, um, no, you're welcome. I know Lewis loves this track. I know a lot of the drivers love driving on this track. I feel like it was a good race last year. It wasn't doing it for me this year. As a product of, of a whole, as the race, for, as a, you know, a customer, a consumer, it wasn't very fun to watch. Now, who knows if this is just because Max is way out in the lead and say Max only had a second or two second lead on Lando. This might have changed the whole race because that's what you look for is the race for first and second. I mean, because that's what the broadcast is most likely going to show. Like you're saying this week, all they could show was Sergio because he was the only one really passing. I mean, I wish they would have showed George passing some more because he did great. But yeah, it was just kind of a boring broadcast. Wasn't the best broadcast. Wasn't really the best race either. I think at one point I was looking at the split times and everybody was like three seconds apart. Like no Nobody was even close to anybody. It was like they were all just spaced out and they were just going around that circuit like parade laps. Again, very evocative of what I remembered the Miami Grand Prix being like, which really broke my heart because Miami's one of my favorite tracks in the F1 games. It is what it is. And this is usually the part of the show where I say we have round 13 next week in the Belgium Grand Prix and we could hope for better, but that's a sprint race weekend right before the summer break. So it's going to get our content worth. We're going to get our content worth, man. Caleb, I think we we both, you know, we'll just have to kind of remember all the fun stuff that we enjoyed from the Canadian and Austrian and Silverstone Grand Prix and just kind of chalk this one up as forgettable. Any final thoughts before we wrap this sucker up? One final thought is Max broke McLaren's record and Lando broke <laughs> Red Bull's trophy. So kind of payback for it's breaking insane. the record. <laughs> What are the odds that <laughs> Red Bull breaks a record that McLaren held for 35 years? And then at the celebration ceremony for this, Lando, a McLaren driver, breaks Red Bull's first place trophy. Estimated to like take six months to create that porcelain trophy in the six figures value wise. Like that's hilarious. But I made a comment on Twitter like, listen, this is even better now because they're going to put this broken trophy in a showcase at the Red Bull factory and it's going to stand out and it's going to be a story that you could tell tourists and future drivers and people for the rest of time. Like, oh, this is when Red Bull broke a 35 year old record and Lando Norris broke the trophy. Like, that's an amazing story. But I imagine they're going to probably put a rule in place so Lando hits isn't able to slam his freaking champagne onto the podium anymore, which is always fun to see yeah i think they need to allow him to continue to do that i hope they don't be no fun fia and well they will be i promise I, you i'm sure they will be but they should allow that but maybe max doesn't need to put the trophy so close to the edge 
I mean, I, that thing was still going to fall no matter what. I mean, it's porcelain. But every single podium that Lando's been on, he's knocked the trophy over. So maybe, But did you maybe see the it. look? Max didn't give it two Oh, shits. they were laughing. Max was like, oh my God, you broke the $100,000 yeah, yeah. trophy. <laughs> Could not give a shit. They Max is thinking about his cats and going home to his girlfriend and Go sitting sim in a sim rig, sim probably. Rig. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, yeah. but that was a great finish. I'm glad you brought that up because it was probably the highlight of the weekend. So shout out to Lando Norris for always keeping it interesting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I hope they don't ban that. I mean, they don't need to. It's a touchdown celebration and it is fun to see and I look forward to seeing it every time that Lando is on the podium because nobody else does that and I think that's part of his brand. Absolutely. Yep. Well, Caleb, man, appreciate you joining me to talk about the Hungarian Grand Prix and appreciate you guys for listening. And uh, Make sure you, if you liked this, follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Check us out over on YouTube at Formula Breakdown and we'll see you guys the next time.